Jesus. All right, if I can trouble you all to please find your seats. Those of you at home, put down your Pepsi and coffee. <laughs> in the pew in front of you, you should see one of these. You're going to need this now. I want to ask you to pick up this piece of laminated paper, turn around, and face Jerusalem. It's over there. In fact, when we go to Israel in October and November, and you're here, and I'm over there, maybe Phil can encourage you all to uh, wave to us and say shalom. <laughs> Good night, right? All right, please join me as we chant the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem, Kivod Machuto, Leolam Vaed. And now for the English. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, and you shall love your neighbor as yourselves. And you may turn around. It's all yours. All right, I am very blessed to have Rebecca helping me with the liturgy today. So, whoops disappeared. There we go. Okay. Yikadava Yikadash Shamerapa Bauma Yira Hirute Veamlik Mahute Beha Yehonuf Yomehon Ukaye de Kod Bet Israel Bagala Bagala Uvis Mahan Kari Vehimeru Omen Yahesh Meraba Mevorak Leola Mola Meomaya And now for the English. Magnified and sanctified be his great name. In the world which he hath created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days. And during the life of all the house of Israel. Even speedily and at a near time. And say ye amen. amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and for all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified. Exalted, extolled, and honored. 
magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One, blessed be He. Though He be high above all the blessings and hymns, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say ye, Amen. Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven, and life for us and for all Israel, and say ye, Amen. Amen. He who he makes, makes peace in his high places, places May he make peace for us and for all Israel. And again, say ye, Amen. Oh, say shalom bim rama. Uya ase shalom aleinu. Vea ko Israel. Veimru. Imru. Omen. Oh, say. Shalom bim ramav, uya ase shalom aleinu, vea ko Israel, veimru imru amen. Ya ase shalom, ya ase shalom. Shalom Aleinu Be'ako Israel Ya'ase Shalom Ya'ase Shalom Shalom Aleinu Be'ako Israel Oh say Shalom Bim Ramav Uya'ase Shalom Aleinu Ve'ako Israel, ve'imru, imru, amen. And may there be abundant peace from heaven, and life for us, and for all Israel, and say ye, amen. amen. And now for the song of Moses and Miriam as they cross the Red Sea. Mi hamoka belim Adonai, mi kamoka ner darba kodesh, nora tehilo o sefele. Shira kadesha shebekuike olim, leshim has fai hayam. Ya kulam hadu veim leku veam. Everybody rise, please. Adonai lak leolam vayed sur Israel kuma bezret Israel ufte. Israel, go aleinu Adonai sevaot shemo kadosh Israel, Baruch atah Adonai God Israel. And what we said is, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, mighty in holiness, too awesome for praise, doing wonders? With a new song to the redeemed ones, praise your name at the seashore. Together, Together they, all they all gave thanks, thanks for your kingdom, kingdom and said, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Rock, Rock of Israel, Israel rise to the aid of Israel, Israel and redeem us as you spoke, spoke Judah and Israel. Israel. Our Lord, our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is your name, the Holy One of Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, Redeemer of Israel. Amen. Adonai, Safatai Tiftak, Ufia Gita Hilateha. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall declare thy praise. What we're going to do now is just take a couple moments for silent prayer. This is your time with God, you alone. 
So whatever is on your heart, if there's anything you're particularly thankful for, take a couple of moments and let God know what you appreciate. And if there's anything that might be troubling you or that you need to ask him or talk to him about, again, take a few moments to do that, and then I'll close us off verbally in just a couple moments. Lord God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for wanting us to look to you and to rely upon you and for answering our prayers. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing your love by providing for our needs day in and day out. Thank you for this cool, safe building in which we worship. Lord, as you know, the safety was shattered in Norway this weekend, and many innocent people were murdered, and our hearts go out to these people and their families. And we pray that you would bless them, and that you'd raise up your servants to bring peace and healing to that land in the name of Yeshua. If there's aught we can do, Lord, show us. As for our own country, help us to be ministers of peace. You said, blessed are the peacemakers. Lord, may we be peacemakers. And please give us opportunity, wisdom, and boldness to share the message of peace as ambassadors of peace for Messiah Yeshua. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Austin's going to bring us our scripture reading this morning. So, Austin, the microphone is yours. Our Torah reading this morning comes from Psalm 62. It'll be verses 1 through 8 if you want to follow in your pew Bible or your own personal Bible. And as you turn there, please join me as we say the blessings for the reading of the Torah and of the scripture. Baruch et Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Miko HaAmim, Vinatan Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah. Amen. And now the same thing in English. I said, Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed, and you responded with. Blessed be the Lord, who is to be blessed forever and ever. And then I said, Blessed be the Lord, who is to be blessed forever and ever. And blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and has given us your Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down? This leaning wall, this tottering fence, they fully intend to topple him from his holy place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless but in their hearts they curse. Selah. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him.
He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu torat emet v'chaye olam nata b'tochenu Baruch ata Adonai noten haTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the law of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17. How many of you have ever heard this saying before? What you see is what you get. Yeah, most of you have. Or how about this one? Seeing is believing. I like magic. And I've come to believe seeing is not believing. These guys do sleight of hand. You know there's a trick. You know it's not real. But you go, how did they do that? I was watching America's Got Talent. This guy had this mirror, and he went behind it, and he stepped through it, and then he knocked on it, and it was whole. And then the judge said, can you turn that thing around? And he did. And it was a mirror. And everybody was like, wow, how did you do that? Seeing is not believing. I don't care what people say. Albert Einstein, he's sharp. He was sharp about so many things. Listen to what he said. Reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. <laughs> uh, I hear what you're saying, and to some extent I, I get it. Yes and no. This is a real popular saying, especially in leadership circles. Perception is reality. Well, this is what I believe. Reality is reality. <laughs> What we perceive is not necessarily reality. But it is true that if we think it's reality and then behave a certain way based on what we perceived, it ends up making a difference. When we react or behave in accordance with what we see, our behavior can be wrong if the thing we see isn't true or real. How many of you have ever done this? And there was nothing there. You thought you saw something. It was a bird 100 yards away, just out of the corner of your eye, and you flinched. Or how many of you went and saw the doctor because you kept seeing these things, only to find out you got floaters? I, every once in a while, I do this. <laughs> and then I realize, Steve, you're looking sane. You're the only one that can see it. Little things floating around inside my eyeballs. Freaky little things. Call floaters. Yeah, they're there, and I see them, but nobody else does. Do you ever freak out because you thought you saw something that you didn't really see? I was a kid, and we were, our family was driving along, and my stepdad stopped the truck, wouldn't let us look, just said, don't, don't look, stay here. Next thing you know, it, a cop car comes with the lights on, and they pulled a mannequin out of the woods with no clothes on, but at night, in the rainy weather, driving by, they thought it was a dead body. You can't fault them. That's what they saw. But guess what? That's not what they saw. They thought that's what they saw. But if that's what they saw, isn't that what they saw? It's kind of weird. What you see isn't always what you get. I'm going to show you a video that proves what you see is not always real. Watch these dice and tell me if they're turning out. How is it that we're watching these dice and they turn up, they turn down, they turn up, they turn down, but they're all turning in one direction? Okay, you can kill it. Thank you very much. Isn't that wild? It's an optical illusion. I like to call them optical delusions. 
because you're not really seeing what you think you're seeing. Here's how our brain works. Let's say the entire front of the synagogue here was a wall, a brick wall, a red brick wall. And I say, can you see the whole red brick wall? And you say, yes, I see the whole red brick wall. You really don't. Your mind sees it in pieces and fills in the pieces. Your mind takes images and then translates and interprets them. So your eyes see something, your brain sees something else. And that's why optical illusions work, because they mess with the part of the brain that's trying to fill in the pieces, and they do it on purpose to mess you up. It's pretty fun, it's pretty cool, but I just want you to understand that seeing is not necessarily believing. Two people can see the exact same thing and see something different. Am I right? Right, so you can't always trust what you see. Am I right? You can't always trust what you perceive to be real. Am I right? I am right. This really plays into case in 1 Samuel 17, and hopefully for your entire spiritual life until you go and see the Lord. We have to understand that what we see may not be what's real, and what is real we may not see. We cannot trust our perception of reality. So then whose do you trust? See, when you were a little kid and you called your mom in for the third time because you see the boogeyman in the closet. I'm not making this up. I saw him. I swore to you on a stack of Bibles, the boogeyman's in the closet. I see him. My mom came in and said, look, no boogeyman. Sneaky little guy. He took off when you came in. Go, shut the door, turn off the light. There he is again. Three times. Mom got fed up. I was scared. Boogeyman's in the closet. What is the way the clothes were arranged? Got to trust your mom. Your mom's not going to let the boogeyman get you. Your perception of reality, Junior, is not right. Trust mommy and daddy. They know what's good for you. Okay, you're a grown-up. Now who are you going to trust? Because your perception of reality is not always right. The Philistines gathered for battle in Soko, a town in Judah. Something happened here that all of Israel saw, but saw wrong, except for one man. Their perception of reality was wrong. One man's was right. Now, do I have a picture of the uh, valley here? There we go. Let's take a look-see here. All righty. So you see these uh, mountaintops here? It was quite customary for one group of bad guys to gather on one and one group of bad guys to gather on another. So let's just say Saul's camp was on this hill and the Philistines were on this hill and then they met with a few of their lead guys down in the middle to taunt one another because they had to work themselves up to fight. They were kind of, they were silly that way. They didn't just go fight. They were like, your mama. And then the other army would say, your mama. He said, you don't let him talk to your mom about that? You let him talk to your mom about that. And they just taunt each other. See, your God's stupid. Your God's ugly. Don't talk about my God that way. You want to do something about it? Come on over here. And eventually they'd work themselves up into a hissy fit and they'd fight. Well, there was another way they fought too. Say, I tell you what we'll do. You present a champion, we'll present a champion. If your champion wins, you win. If our champion wins, we win. Deal? Till their champion came forward. The Philistines gathered for battle in Soko, a town in Judah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Elah Valley where they got ready to fight the Philistines. The Philistines lined up on one hill and the Israelites on another with a valley between them. A man named Goliath from the city of Gath came out from the Philistine camp to challenge the Israelites. He was over nine feet tall. No, this isn't a typo. He was massive. He might have been closer to 10 feet tall. And these are using the conservative cubits. He was huge. He wore bronze armor that weighed about 125 pounds, as well as a bronze helmet. His armor weighed about 125 pounds. Now, the typical Israeli, maybe David, was about 5'5". Five five. 
And I'm guessing he probably weighed somewhere between 125 and 150 pounds. Goliath went to battle with a full-grown Israeli man's weight on his body. That's how big this man was. His legs were protected by bronze armor. He carried a bronze javelin slung over his shoulder. His spear was as thick as the bar on a weaver's loom. I have no bit idea how big a weaver's loom was in ancient Israel a couple thousand years ago. And its iron head on the spear weighed about 15 pounds, depending on the estimate, 15 to 20. A soldier walked in front of him carrying his shield. All right, here's what I have. I've got Goliath's spear. Now, you notice the head is a little disproportionate. <laughs> but the weight of the head is not. So after services, those of you who are interested can actually come up and see how heavy it is. You notice I'm handling it by the head. That's not how you go to battle. You handle it back here so you can thrust. I'm not strong enough to hold it back here and even hold it up, let alone, let alone thrust with it. That's about as far back as I can go. Otherwise, I'll drop it. He used this thing to thrust if he went to battle. <clears throat> How strong do you got to be to do that with this thing? So when Goliath said, come fight me, and he approached the other advance guard, everybody scattered like ants. Nobody wanted to stand up to that guy. Literally, it'd be like a four or five-year-old versus me, size and all wise. Virtually a toddler against a grown man. Mass-wise, height-wise. Nobody in their right mind would fight that guy. They're going to have to come up with a new way of warfare because this ain't working. He came out every day for like a month, taunting and teasing, and no matter how bad he insulted their mama, they would not fight him because he was just too stinking scary. Goliath was over nine feet tall. When he came, the people fled. David wasn't scared at all. You see, perception isn't reality. Everybody in Israel saw a giant. That's not what David saw. David saw something different. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me can imagine what his voice was like. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man. Let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. But not David. See, David wasn't there for that month. He had just brought some food for his brothers, heard this for the first time. And David was like, oh yeah? Why are you guys putting up with this? And they're like, David, go home. Little arrogant little brat. Why are we putting up with this? Get out of here. What do you know? David was shaming his brothers unintentionally because they were scared to go fight him. David was like, guys, come on. You heard what he said. Let's go. He talked about your God. Go get him. They were like, shut up. Go home. You don't belong here, David, little five-foot-five guy. David said to Saul, your majesty, no one should be afraid of this Philistine. I'll go fight him. What did David see that the rest of the Israelites did not see? Well, what did the Israelites see that David didn't see? Somebody's perception of reality was skewed. But I know this, David didn't see what they saw. And they didn't see what David saw. Their perception was that Goliath was dangerous. But perception is not reality. Reality is, David was more dangerous. Their perception was Goliath's size was the biggest problem. The reality is, though, from David's perspective, a pagan is insulting Israel and our God. That's our problem. 
Goliath isn't the problem. What he's doing is the problem. Whether he was four foot four or nine foot four, that's got to stop now. David was a solutions guy, not a problems guy. David was offended at Goliath and didn't care how big he was. Hey, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Things are not always as they appear. David was not at all intimidated by Goliath. Somehow he saw something different than everybody else. I'll tell you, David saw God. Listen, here's David, here's Goliath. Here's Goliath, and there's God. David's on God's side. Why is he at all concerned about Goliath? He's not. David was the only one seeing reality that day, people. Goliath was no problem at all. But David was the only one who knew it. There was a day that the apostle Peter and his fellow disciples were in a boat. And a storm came up, and they were fearful. And then all of a sudden, they saw a ghost walking on the Sea of Galilee, and they freaked out. And Yeshua said, no, no, don't freak out. Hey, guys, it's okay, it's me. Peter said, if it's you, let me come out, come on out to you. Yeshua said, come. So he got out of the boat and he started walking to Jesus. It was all good. Then the wave kicked up and the storm blew a little harder. And he took his eyes off of Yeshua and he saw the wave. And he started to sink. His perception, his reality was spot on. No worries. It's all good. There's the Messiah. I'm walking on water. Life's good. But as soon as he took his eyes off and saw the wave... He started to sink. You and me, we might sink in water. But Yeshua was there. No worries. Perception is not reality. Reality is reality. And sometimes we got to skew our perception to line up with it. Really? There's no boogeyman in there? You swear? Look, I'll move the clothes. All right, I guess I'll trust you. I see the boogeyman. But if he's really not there... So David offers to fight Goliath. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he's been a warrior since he was a boy. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, and I struck it, and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. See, it wasn't like David was some mamby-pamby kid with a lot of faith and decided to go off to war. David was a warrior already. He was a tough guy. He already killed at least one lion and one bear with his bare hands. Not too many people can say that. People usually kill them with rifles from 100 yards away, 200 yards away if they're lucky. A charging lion coming at a man with a modern rifle, he may soil his pants. It's a scary thing. David grabbed it by the beard and struck it with a knife. Probably beat on it with his hands, too. David was tough, but still a fully armored, nine-foot-something giant. David wasn't, wasn't scared. He took his shepherd's stick picked up five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his bag with his sling ready. He went out to meet Goliath. Now, why does it say he picked up five smooth stones? Why does it just say he grabbed a stone? Why does it say he was ready and he... Why does it throw that detail in there? I don't know, but I do know this. Goliath had four brothers. I do know that. So it says he picked up five stones. It seems reasonable to conclude that David said, one per brother. I'll take out Goliath with the first one, then I'm going after the others. David was a man amongst men, and he was a man of God, and he was going to retrieve Israel's honor and God's honor this day. Goliath said to David, what's that stick for? You think I'm a dog? And he called down curses from his God on David. Come on, he challenged David, and I'll give your body to the birds and animals to eat. They just shut up and fight. You know, these guys, they're all talk. David answered, you're coming against me with sword and spear and javelin, 
But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the Israelite armies, which you have defied. Oh, this is getting good. This very day, the Lord put you in my power. I will defeat you and cut off your head. Whoa, David. Don't bandy words with a little mad Israelite boy. He'll win. I'm going to whack off your head, and I'll give the bodies of the Philistine soldiers to the birds and animals to eat. Then the whole world will know that Israel has a God. And everyone here will see the Lord does not need swords or spears to save his people. David wasn't doing this because he was arrogant. He wasn't even doing this because he was brave. He was doing this because this man insulted his God. And it just wasn't the right thing to do. And it's not like he was some jihadi out to get God's honor and vengeance. This was in Judah, in the territory God had given to Israel. These were invaders. So it was just, somebody had to chase them out. And if you guys are scared to do it, I'm not, says David. Oh, the best part of the story is in verse 48. Goliath started walking toward David, and David ran quickly to fight him. I could just see, David was like a pit bull on a leash. And they let it go, and he's just like, boom! He wasn't timid, he wasn't scared. He ran for this fight. Put his stone in his sling, and waha! Took him out. That's it. It wasn't some long, protracted battle. David had a range weapon. David got running, threw his momentum into the swing, swing, sling, stone hit him in the head. Goliath fell over. Everybody on the Philistine and Israelite side was up. Then David got on him, took out Goliath's sword, and whacked off Goliath's head, and then held it up. And all the Philistines went, pew. They were scared. David chased the entire army. They were scared of David. I saw this cool picture. It was a riot scene. And there's a whole mob of people and a cop with a dog, on, a German shepherd on a leash out front. And the dog was just like, let me at him. I'll take you all one at a time. Keeping the whole mob at bay. Because nobody wants to be the first one to meet that dog. David was like that. They were scared to death. It hit him on the forehead, broke his skull, and Goliath fell face down on the ground. He ran to him, stood over him, took Goliath's sword out of its sheath, cut off his head, and killed him. And when the Philistines saw that their hero, hero was dead, they ran away. The men of Israel and Judah shouted, ran after them, pursuing them all the way to Gath and to the gates of Ekron. They came from Gath to Judah to take over some Judah territory. They chased them right back to their own city gates. And stay there! <laughs> what we see isn't always what we get. Perception is not reality. And we cannot always trust our perception of things. If you're not convinced of that yet, I've got one more video. Because I want to send you home doubting your ability to trust yourself. That's my goal. Because I want you to trust God and his word over your own perception of reality. This video is to test your perception. Pay close attention. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. 
I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. I went back and I looked at it again just to make sure they weren't messing with my head the second time around and those changes weren't really made. They were really made the first time around. I was like, wow. You can't really trust your own perception of reality. You can't. We can't always trust our judgment. The Bible says, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. If we can't trust our own judgment, then whose do we trust? Either nobody's or God's. The Bible says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Don't trust your own perception of reality. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. The Bible says this, Humanity is lost and destined for hell. I don't know how many times people have told me, I don't believe in hell. I don't care. That's your perception of reality, based on nothing. Really, I mean, at least if you got an opinion about who to vote for, it's based on something. What's your belief in an absence of hell based on? It's just, I don't like the concept, so I'm going to disbelieve it and wish it out of existence. But the Bible says hell is real. Yeshua, Jesus, died to keep you from going there. It matters. Now, that's God's perception of reality. Who's you going to trust? Hopefully you agree and understand that yours is not trustworthy. God's is. The Bible says that we can be saved and only saved by rejecting our sin and trusting in Jesus, Yeshua, who died for our sins and rose again. The Bible says without him, there is no hope. I understand many people don't believe that. I, I get that. My point was just to sow a little doubt that maybe your perception of reality, when it disagrees with the Bible, is wrong. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, I think of the song that says, Open the eyes of my heart. There are so many people who are creating their own perceptions of reality to their own hurt. They're going to trust the things that they both perceive to be true, only to lose their own souls, Lord. It's horrible. It's a, it's a tragedy. And so I pray that you would send forth your Holy Spirit and open the eyes of the blind and the hearts of those who are hardened and help them to see what you say is true, that we are lost in our sins. Lord, it's easy to see it when over 80 children are murdered, but from day to day we forget. Help us to see it day to day. Not so that we'll despair, Lord, but so that we'll have hope in you and in your Son. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I know that... Um... Steve usually does this benediction at the end. Um, I hope he will forgive me for usurping um, that a little bit right now. If you'd all stand with us, please. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you.
Well, before I let you go, a few things. If you want to feel the heft of the spear, feel free to come up and do that. Just be ca cautious that one of the weights inside the spearhead didn't fall off and smash your toe. So handle it carefully. It is heavy. Um, Tuesday, August 9th is Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av. Um, the 9th of Av is set aside as a special day for Jewish people. It's usually a time of prayer and fasting to remember, commemorate uh, the destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple, as well as some other horrible things that have happened to our people. So it's a time that we get together for prayer and worship. Um, it'll be Tuesday, August 9th, here at 6.30. So hopefully you can join us for that. For those of you who are going to Israel with me or thinking about coming with me, please meet me up front for our meeting here. And uh, that should just take a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes. The rest of you, God bless you very hard. Hopefully I'll see you Wednesday night for services, if not next Shabbat. Don't feel like you have to rush off. Turn around and say shalom to somebody. God bless you, and I will see you next week.